Today's story is brought to you by Tobias Malm, the creator of The Cave to Another World, a continuation of a fantastic series I covered many years ago, titled We Found a Portal to a World Where Homo Sapiens Never Evolved. It's a fantastic and interesting story that I highly recommend you read by supporting Tobias Mom by following the link in the description and buying a copy for yourself. Thank you. My wife and I ended up in a world where the South won the Civil War. We saw what the world became without the United States. It shocked us. Every time I close my eyes, I'm transported back to that fateful summer. The events that unfolded seemed like a never-ending nightmare, and the scars they left behind are still raw. But I've made it back home, and after much reflection and contemplation, I know that the story needs to be told. Maybe it's a way for me to come to terms with what happened. Perhaps it's to warn others of the horrors that can lurk in the shadows, and sometimes even in the light of day. Whatever the reason, I'm ready to share it now. We were driving Route 1, the sun shining down on us as we made our way toward Richmond, Virginia for our honeymoon. Shanice was behind the wheel, her hand intertwined with mine, and I couldn't help but smile at how lucky I was to have her as my wife. It had been a long trip, and we were both tired from the wedding. We couldn't wait to check in at the hotel and finally start our life together. It had been a long journey to get to this point in our lives, as we had faced many challenges and obstacles along the way, but we had always stuck together, supporting each other through thick and thin. Shanice looked at me, exhausted but still as beautiful as ever. Here comes the sun by the Beatles played on the radio, and as the sun continued to shine down on us, we sang along to the lyrics, feeling grateful for the love and joy that surrounded us. The scenery passing by was breathtaking, and I took it all in, realizing how truly blessed we were to have each other in this moment. As we neared our destination, excitement built up inside of us. We looked forward to the adventures and memories we were about to create. It never felt more at peace. Then something interrupted that peace. A bang came from the sky, like thunder, but sharper. It was so powerful that Shanice almost lost control of the vehicle. For a moment I felt nauseous, and then the song on the radio glitched out and was replaced by a harsh male voice. According to eyewitnesses, a large submarine was seen cruising along the coastline of Havana earlier this morning. The witnesses claimed that the submarine appeared to be of Japanese origin and was flying the flag of the rising sun. The sighting has not been confirmed by authorities, but the reports are being taken very seriously. There was a whistling sound piercing through the air, growing louder and more intense by the second, and maybe a mile ahead of us, we saw a bright, glowing object streaking towards the ground. My god, Shanice asked as she slowed down. What is that? The song on the radio came back intermittently, but kept glitching out. It must be a meteorite, I said, my voice filled with excitement and awe. That's incredible. There was a loud boom to our right and the car shook as part of the meteorite must have hit the ground, creating a massive explosion. I could feel the heat of the impact, even from where we were. Wow, Shanice whispered, her eyes wide with shock. That was something else? She pulled over. Some dirt landed on the hood of the car. Do we call someone? I, I don't know. I looked at the smoke rising from the crater. Where did the big one go? Should have hit the ground by now. But it hadn't. It was as if it had disappeared altogether. Let's get out. Let's go check the crater. I said with some excitement now that my shock had subsided. Wait. Shinnies put her hand on my shoulder. What's up with the radio? I hadn't paid any attention to it. It was still broadcasting the other channel, but there was a woman talking now is well aware of the political implications of a conflict between the British Empire and the Empire of Japan, and they're all taking necessary measures to prevent it from escalating. What about it? I said. Let's get out and... Just wait, would you? They said something strange just now. Didn't you hear it? Something about... She looked worried. Just listen for a second, okay? 
An elderly man was talking now. It sounded like a recording of a speech. Confederate States of America will continue to work with our allies to ensure peace and stability in the world. We believe that diplomacy and dialogue are the best means to resolve disputes and maintain stability in the international community. I felt nauseous again. The column of smoke coming from the crater next to the road appeared almost sickening now, although I couldn't tell exactly why. It's... I swallowed nervously. It's just some radio show, honey. She changed the channel. Well, Bob, the return to Africa bill was definitely a step in the right direction when it came to giving African slaves their freedom after the so-called Great Slave Surplus in the 60s when modern farming equipment replaced, I would say, most slaves working on the fields. However, it had had some unintended consequence of creating a shortage in the construction industry that's still felt today. A lot of people are arguing that it's time to end the practice of slavery on a national level, point to the success of the British and even the Japanese, who both abolished slavery long ago. They also say the practice makes our people look indolent. Some even go as far as use the word lazy in the eyes of the international community. What do you think about that, Mary? Are the American people ready to give up? What the hell? That's another channel? What's going on, James? Shanice looked at me, her eyes filled with fear. It's just a coincidence, I said as I picked up my phone. Try another channel. You'll see. I'll call 911 and alert the authorities about... Actually, I don't have a signal. Do you? She's already looking at her phone. No, me neither. With a trembling hand, she tuned the radio to another channel yet again. A strange opera-like song was just fading out and was being replaced by the voice of a cheerful man. Are you looking for a reliable and hard-working servant? Look no further than South Shore Trading Company. Our servants are the best in the business. They do the hard work for you so you can relax and enjoy your time. We have a wide selection of servants to fit your needs, from cooking and cleaning to gardening and childcare. Get the help you need with our top-notch servants. Visit South Shore Trading Company today and get the perfect servant for your family. Shanice turned the radio off and stepped out of the car. I followed her. She was trying to light a cigarette. Let's drive to the nearest town and report the meteor impact from there, I suggested. And whatever's going on with the radio, I don't know. Must be some kind of collaboration between the stations to spread awareness. Must have just missed the context, that's all. I mean, what else could it be? Something isn't right, Shanice said. I'm feeling off, like something's just wrong. That thing? That thing from the sky? It... Don't you feel it? I did feel it. The feeling of impending doom. But I didn't want to admit it to myself, and since it didn't seem to make sense to me, I didn't want to worry my wife further by mentioning it. All good reasons to get out of here. We got back into the car. Shanice took the passenger seat, too upset to drive, and let me take the wheel. I took one last look at the column of smoke. Part of me still wanting to check out the crater to see what was hiding in it, but by now it was nothing more than a morbid curiosity. All excitement was gone. I put the pedal to the metal. The dust from the impact blew off the windscreen as we made sure we got the hell out of there as fast as possible. After driving for some time without turning on the radio, the dread that had settled in me didn't go away as I would have hoped, but it rather increased. Something was off but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. Shanice, constantly checking her phone to see if the signal was back, didn't say much, but I could tell she was feeling the same. An odd-looking truck drove past us in the opposite direction. It had a strangely prolonged hood, and the trailer attached to it was reminiscent of a classic wagon, albeit made of black metal. The body of the truck was a weathered brown, and the large black wheels and rugged tires added to its unusual appearance. Just before it passed, I noticed the driver, an elderly black man wearing a grey corporate overall, looking down at us with a facial expression of disbelief. What the hell kind of truck was that? I said. Did you see that? Maybe we should go back. Shanice bit her nails, as she always did when she was nervous or stressed. I'm telling you, something absolutely crazy is going on. It's not just the meteorite, the radio, or the truck, it's everything. I know it sounds silly, honey, 
but I just don't think we should continue down this road. I drove to the side of the road and stopped the car. I'm freaked out too, I said. But what could possibly be going on? We could have been killed by that meteor and we're both still in shock, I think. Now we can go back for sure, but this is supposed to be our honeymoon. And do we really want whatever this is to ruin that? We should be in Ashland soon. Maybe we should at least go there and... A harsh siren, reminiscent of a fire alarm, came from behind us. I looked in the rearview mirror. A police car, similar to the strange truck but smaller and more aerodynamic, had pulled up behind us. Two officers wearing leather jackets, black boots, and Stetson hats stepped out of the vehicle as soon as they had turned off the dreadful sirens. Shanice was shaking next to me, anticipating something I couldn't even imagine. I locked the doors to the car and put my hand on the key, getting ready to get out of there. As they walked to our car, I saw in the rearview mirror that they had both been wearing Confederate flags on their sleeves. Those aren't real cops, Shanice yelled, probably after noticing the same thing. Just drive! I turned the key and the engine roared to life. I stepped on the gas pedal and the car lurched forward. The officers quickly jumped back into their own car and began to pursue us. I made a U-turn and began driving back towards Washington. The police car, or whatever it was, remained close behind us, its flashing lights filling the car with an eerie red glow. Shanice was crying and yelling at me to go faster. I drove as fast as I could, but the police car remained at our heels. I couldn't believe, nor understand, what was happening. All I knew was that we had to get away from those men and get in touch with the real police. Up ahead, where the meteor had hit the ground, I noticed that a roadblock had been set up, blocking our escape. I swerved onto a dirt road, hoping to lose our pursuers, but their vehicle was too nimble and it followed us. Eventually, we came to a small town. Here, I thought, the madness had come to an end. We just needed to find some normal, decent people and get in touch with the authorities. Oh my god, Shanice said. It, it's everywhere! In front of us, outside what looked like a town hall building, was a flagpole flying the Confederate flag. I pushed the car to its limits, swerving around corners and accelerating down straightaways. The people on the sidewalks looked at us in astonishment. The clothes they wore were a strange, eerie mix of bygone eras as if they'd stepped straight out of another time. The women were draped in long, flowing dresses that were reminiscent of the 1940s, with their hair styled in soft waves and their lips painted a deep red. But there were also touches of more archaic style, with corsets peeking out and parasols clutched in their gloved hands. The men, too, were dressed in a way that was both familiar and foreign. They wore suits with wide lapels and suspenders, but the trousers were cut higher, almost to the knee, and the shoes were shiny and black with large buckles. The overall effect was unsettling, as if they had somehow stepped out of a dream and into the modern world, still dressed in a garb of a long-gone time. The road ahead split into two directions. I had to make a quick decision. I swerved to the left and took a sharp turn, only to face down another one of those strange police cars. I stepped on the brakes and was just about to back up when the other car showed up behind us. Fuck! I yelled. What do we do? Shanice asked. James? The officers stepped out of their cars and surrounded us, all of them with their hands on their holsters. One of them, a tall man with a narrow face, knocked on the window next to me with his baton. Reluctantly, I rolled down the window, feeling my heart in my throat, and grabbed Shanice's hand. Step out of the vehicle, both of you, said the man. You're under arrest. I don't understand, they said. What's up with that flag with... Another officer, a short man with a heavy build, appeared next to the tall man. Toyota, he said with a sudden drawl. Sounds Japanese. Flag, said the tall man. Which flag? You are under arrest for the evasion of the law and reckless endangerment. Now are you going to step out of the car, or do we have to pull you out? This is insane, I whispered under my breath. Look, I don't know what twisted, racist, reenactment, role-playing game, or sheer fantasy you're trying to live out, but last time I checked, this was still the United States of America. Um, what you're doing to us is illegal. The officers laughed. We're not in the U.S. anymore, 
Shanice said. James, don't you get it? Wh what? I said, confused. This is ridiculous. So, let me get this straight, the officer said with a smirk. You're driving around in a strange Japanese vehicle dressed like I don't know what and pretending to be from the United States of America, and you're suggesting that it is us that lives in a fantasy world? You need to step out of the car and come with us to the station. It's either that or the hard way, which none of us want. This isn't our world, Shanice whispered. Something happened when that meteor hit. Something impossible. I just know it. I felt it instantly. Okay, but what do we do? I'm terrified. We have to play along. It's all we can do now. The officer knocked on the roof of the car with his baton. No more Bible, get out of the car! Okay! I slowly opened the door and stepped out of the car. Shanice following close behind me. The officers still had their hands close to their guns, ready to grab them at a moment's notice. The officer closest to us searched us taking our phones and wallets before leading us to their police car. The officer receiving the items accidentally lit up the display on our phones and dropped it out of surprise. His colleague bent down and picked it up. Don't you ever watch the vision box, Earl? He said. These devices just released in Japan. If you ask me... He lowered his voice. If you ask me, we're dealing with two spies here. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. The short officer said after he placed his next to the car. I did as I was told, feeling the cold metal of the handcuffs being snapped around my wrists, and so did Shanice. Please, sir, I said trying to appeal their sense of reason. We don't mean any harm. We just want to get out of here and get on with our honeymoon. Don't tell them anything, Shanice hissed. Are you crazy? Your honeymoon's going to be spent in jail, said the tall officer. As it should, said the short one as he placed us in the back seat of the police car. Seeing as your marriage ain't legal here, or did you get married in Japan? He laughed. And then you came all the way here with your weird little Japanese car dressed like complete jesters to celebrate your marriage that isn't the least bit appreciated? This story just keeps getting crazier and crazier. They took us to a small, dingy police station where we were thrown into a cell. The officers left us there without saying a word, leaving us to our thoughts. What did you mean when you said we weren't in the U.S. anymore? I asked, leaning against the bars of the cell. Are you suggesting this is some kind of alternate reality? That's exactly what I'm suggesting. I think that meteor teared up the fabric of a reality somehow and... That's insane! I shook my head. We're dealing with a group of deranged people who's living out some far-right wet dream. It's just a bunch of QAnon that's come together in this little backwards town and- What about the radio, huh? Shanice interrupted. They could have easily hijacked it somehow. I don't know, but- And the strange vehicles? You think they designed and built their own fully functioning make-believe cars as well? What you're suggesting isn't exactly more believable. Listen, James, I'm telling you. We pass through some kind of rift in space-time, or, I don't know, some kind of interdimensional portal, and now we're stuck in a world where the freaking Confederacy won the Civil War. I spotted a newspaper underneath the bed Shanice was sitting on. I picked it up, hoping it would prove her wrong, but was instead met with more evidence to the contrary. It was called the Richmond Examiner. Based on the date, it was only a week old. The headline of the main story read, Crisis in the Pacific. British and Japanese fleets clash. I sighed and tossed the paper at Shanice. They've really paid attention to the details. These people are trying to get under our skin, trying to brainwash us. Possibly to force us to do something which will... Shanice, who had picked up the newspaper, interrupted me. This is real. Listen to this, okay? She said, beginning to read from the newspaper. It has been several weeks since tensions between the British Empire and the Empire of Japan reached boiling point, with reports of a Japanese fleet creating a blockade around the Hawaiian Islands. This comes in response to the Confederate States of America's decision to allow the British Empire to place nuclear weapons on the islands. The move has been seen as a direct threat to Japanese security, leading to a build-up of military presence in the region. She paused. 
James, they got pictures and everything, and why would they pick this as their main story if it was fake? Wouldn't they pick something more domestic? She continued to read. The crisis has been escalating, with both sides refusing to back down. The British Empire, with its powerful naval presence in the Pacific, has deployed additional vessels to the region, whilst the Japanese fleet remains on high alert. The situation is rapidly deteriorating, with fears of an all-out war becoming increasingly real. Anyone can fake anything these days. You know that. Let's just try to think of a way to get out of- The tall officer entered the room. He sat down on a wooden stool in front of us, his earlier aggressive expression now calm, and lit a cigar whilst looking at us with a piercing gaze. I'm Carlos, and I'm the sheriff of this town. He took a puff of his cigar. You're James and Shanice. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Robertson? At least according to those little cards we found in your wallets. On those cards, it actually says you're from the United States of America. That's curious, seeing that the United States of America doesn't exist anymore. Your Japanese equipment tells me you're spies. Hired to accomplish some mission, but then again, why would spies come up with some ridiculous fiction rather than try to blend in? Maybe you aren't spies at all, but just activists trying to make a statement. If so, I'm guessing you're some former servant, Shanice, rebelling against the system. I ran both your names through the calculator and nothing came up. Which is another oddity. Perhaps you're spies after all. Anyhow, this case is a bit above my pay grade. My colleague decided to report you to Clea. What's that? Shanice asked. What's Clea? Why, the Confederate Law Enforcement Agency, of course. They'll pick you and your equipment up and transfer you to Richmond. That's what's going to happen. He leaned forward and lowered his voice. Here's the thing, though. I think there's something more going on than what I'm being told. And I would very much appreciate it if you would tell me what it is. All I know at the moment is that something fell from the sky earlier today, just out of town, and now they've cut off traffic on Rebel Route telling everybody there's been a gas leak. Why would we tell you anything? Shanice asked. You're the one I won't be up front with you, Carlos said with an even lower voice. I don't like it when the government comes to my town, lying to my face and tell me what to do, and I don't like how they treat your people. He looked at Shanice. I know about that lie, and it's the ugliest of them all. In my youth, I worked with one of those so-called temporary detention camps after they passed the Return to Africa bill. He took a deep breath. I was just a kid back then, but I understood what they were doing there, and it wasn't freeing any slaves. What did they do? I asked sick to my stomach. You've already heard the so-called conspiracy theories. Well, I saw them with my own eyes. It's all true. What conspiracy theories? Shanice added. You really don't know anything about this stuff. Carlos took another puff and looked at us with suspicious eyes. It was just another big slave trade. Only a handful was shipped to Liberia as free men. The vast majority were sold to Belgian Congo and some other colonies where they needed more workers in the mines. But even over there, the need for more workers wasn't big enough to accommodate our surplus. Carlos looked down at the floor. So they built these big chambers, looking almost like churches to see everywhere beside the road. And they took them there, the ones unfit, too old too young, and the ones unwilling. Then what did they do? Shanice asked, tearing up. What did you do? It was so crowded in there. They were all standing shoulder to shoulder, not knowing what would come next. I was a kid back then, but they sent me in there to clean up after the process was done. That's what I did. This was close to Matanzas. And, being of Spanish descent, I wasn't valued much higher than the former slaves. I was just trying to help my parents pay rent. Anyhow, I wouldn't be sending any one of your people their way if I could prevent it. 
You know, when I see the more rebellious Whigs up north hanging up the Union flag, their windows or front yards, I wonder what it would have been like if things were different. History had taken another turn, so to speak. It's a childish fantasy, but seeing you in your possession, your strange car, your curious electronic devices, and your odd-looking plastic cards with the United States of America written all over them, well, it makes me wonder. We aren't spies. Shanice walked up to the bars. That thing fell from the sky. It came from space and had some kind of effect on it. A group of men in black cloaks flung open the door and strode purposefully into the room, radiating an air of confidence and command. Carlos stood up and straightened his back, leaving a cigar on the stool. Good evening, sir. We're from Clea, one of the men said in a deep, authoritative tone. We're here to take the prisoners with us, the colored woman and her companion. They're suspected of espionage and high treason. Would you be so kind as to open their cell? He did as he was told, locking eyes with us but not saying anything. This can't be real, I said, still doubtful but less so than before. Hey, don't touch her! Carlos let go of Shanice's arm and allowed her to step out by herself. This isn't right, Shanice said to Carlos as we were led outside by the men. You know this isn't right. It's all wrong. We don't belong here. The men didn't say a word to us. They just threw us in the back of a large black vehicle that looked more like a locomotive than a truck. They had already loaded it with our car. Shanice banged on the back doors as they closed them, begging them to let us out, but to no avail. We sat in total darkness as the vehicle drove away. I held Shanice in my arms, trying to comfort her as best I could. They're driving on the open road now, they said. If the police spot this bizarre vehicle on the road, they'll pull it over and- You still don't understand, Shanice said. I did understand, and it frightened me more than anything but I still held up hope that there was a more mundane explanation to all of this. I don't know. I just don't know. But we're going to get out of this situation one way or another. After about 45 minutes, the vehicle hit the brakes. I wasn't ready and fell down, and so did Shanice. We struggled to get up on our feet, but then threw ourselves on the floor again when we heard gunshots outside. I crawled up to Shanice, trying to find her in the darkness. We heard people yelling, and then some more gunshots. A man's voice could be heard behind the doors shortly after. Stay back and take cover! He then shot at the lock, and the doors swung open. We were pulled out of the vehicle by strong hands. It took a few seconds for my eyes to adjust to the daylight. Two black men, wielding rifles of a sort I'd never seen before, stood in front of us. They wore what looked like fedoras but were otherwise dressed as the men we had seen in the small town. Go, one of them said. Go, go, go! They rushed us to another vehicle. Shanice stopped in her tracks. At first, I thought it was because of the dead bodies on the road, but then she quickly entered their truck and came out with a cotton bag with the word evidence written on it. It contained our personal belongings. The two men yelled for us to hurry up. Just before I jumped into their car, I noticed Richmond in the distance. The city was unrecognizable from what I remembered. Gleaming white marble buildings towered over the landscape, adorned with grandiose statues and flags bearing the symbol of the Confederacy. At that moment I knew. Shanice had been right all along. This was another Earth.